Chris, thanks so much for joining us today for this Jump Cloud Partner Success interview. How are you doing? Yes, very good. Thanks. Thanks for uh, inviting me, Chris. A pleasure to be here. No, it's great. First, uh, the first fellow British voice we've had on the interview series. So really, really looking forward to drilling in and uh, learning more about you. So with that, can you maybe sort of tell us a little about yourself and your MSP? Sure. Yeah. So um, we we really started in 2020. Um, I started the business back in 17, but really first couple of years were mostly spent on on a freelancing activities. But uh, I started the MSP. I was starting it right in the middle of COVID, which um, was um, fun and challenging. Um, but uh, in some respects, it, it probably gave me the time and space and, and forced me to follow through um, on activities that uh, I might have uh, I might have avoided um, otherwise. But uh, but yeah, so really put partnerships in place over that year, and then from the beginning of 2021, um, started working with customers, bringing them on board. Um, and that was really where the, the payoff of COVID for, for us came because we had to onboard, we were onboarding customers, you know, in lockdown. Um, so we had to do it remotely. Um, and as a result, it's allowed us to bring on board customers that probably we wouldn't have done um, pre-COVID um, if we'd formed pre-COVID. Um, so our biggest customers in Germany, um, we've got customers in the UK um, that we've never visited. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, it's been good fun. That's interesting. So your biggest customers in Germany, then how did that come about? So I, I got a bit of a, a background in, in motorsport. So it, it so happened I was supplying some services to a racing team at the beginning of 2021. And this company was just in the process of forming um, and they were a co-supplier to the same race team. And um, they approached me to say, we're, we're actually struggling to get off the ground um, in a couple of areas, in particular around the cloud infrastructure. So I helped them uh, on uh, really deliver that initial cloud infrastructure and the relationship grew from there. So they, they started in 21 um, with, a, with a team just under 10 people, um, but they grew quite quickly. And, uh, and actually in, in many ways, that was really our first proper deployment of Jump Cloud because Jump, we use Jump Cloud to help them um, onboard their team, who again were spread all across Europe. And so it was sort of a joint learning experience. We were onboarding our first customer with Jump Cloud, but uh, it was also helping us um, give them that that expertise and and in particular, I guess, the rem building a team and supporting a team remotely. It really really helped. Yeah, I know that's that's really good to hear, and I'm glad um, I'm glad you went through that experience, but. Um, across your sort of client base, I mean, what is the typical client like? Do you have a, do you work operate in a particular vertical, or are you um, sort of pretty generalist? Yeah, so so I, I think the thing that's common across all of our customers is they're disruptors. So we, we, they're not working across common fields. So we've got a, a customer that's uh, making software for the motorsports industry across the world. Um, we've got another company that is um, delivering a bespoke telemetry solution. Um, we've got a, a, a customer that's working in the, in the medical industry, supporting doctors, and we've got a, a customer that's um, delivering um, uh, agriculture, growing um, produce. But the thing that I've only just recently realised, actually, is that the, the common thread they all share is their disruptors. They're making you know, real changes to the industry that they're, they're, uh, they're working in. And I think that's what we really love working with a disruptor, um, we can help them help achieve their goals um, and and, uh, and grow more quickly. Fascinating. So I guess that's the sort of fast paced sort of quite rapid change environments if the disrupt team is sort of scaling up quickly or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think flexibility is key. Um, so, you know, for us, the, the, the key thing is having a, a set of partners in place, solutions and, and you know, portfolio of of uh, products and, and, and solutions that help us respond as quickly as possible um, to those those needs. And as you say, you know, disruptors generally are um, are trying something new. They're not entirely sure what they need. Um, so having that, you know, partner, flexible partner in place is really important. Yeah, and it's uh, it's it's a great niche, I guess. Uh, and is, is that business generally coming through word of mouth and networking? I mean, how do you find these disruptive disruptors? Yeah, so I, I think, it, I mean, it's true that the, the vast majority of the business is coming through word of mouth. Um, so, um, you know, there's been a, a bit of a bit of 
we've got a, we've got one or two customers that have come through um, LinkedIn posts um, that I've been you know making over the last couple of years. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, word of mouth is the principal source. Yeah. But that's great, right? I mean, I guess word of mouth is probably the best type of uh, business because that shows that you're doing a great. You must be doing a great job to keep getting those inbound referrals from other partners. It's true. You're absolutely right, and and I think I mean it's been a bit of a learning journey for me because I think you know as I was starting the the business in its current form in 2020, I think I had this view that word of mouth was was cheating in some way. You know, if I was just getting it on my reputation, then. I wasn't doing the hard job of, you know, creating a sales funnel and bringing in new clients. Um, I've kind of come full circle now and realised that actually, yeah, great if I can bring in completely new customers, but uh, let's celebrate the word of mouth too. Yeah, you should. Absolutely. And you're right. It probably does feel like cheating, but it, it certainly isn't. So uh, it's, a, it's a huge validation. So well done on that. So um, moving along, we'll talk a little bit about um, your relationship with JumpCloud. I mean, how did you sort of first come across us? So actually, it was pre MSP. Um, it was um, while I was still freelancing, and uh, in order to you know best support you know, the, the customers I was working with, I had um, both uh, Google Workspaces, or it was not called Workspaces at the time, but I had had Google, and I had three six five, and I wanted to find a way to be able to coordinate the two, and that's how I came across Jump Cloud. Uh, then as I started building the MSP business, um, obviously I realized I had, I mean, at that point, I wasn't using a great deal of the feature set, primarily just the cloud directory integration across those two um, providers. Um, but uh, as we started onboarding customers, it was really obvious that uh, the additional feature set in Jump Cloud that we we, we already could see and, and had access to um, was a great fit. Yeah, that's good to know. And obviously, you, you sort of mentioned that uh, you started to introduce that to clients. Uh, what kind of sort of portions of Jump Clouds do you use and what sort of pain points are you solving for your clients? So, so now we're, we're using most of the stack. Um, so, I, I mean, it started principally with Cloud Directory and SSO. They were the two initial um, key drivers. Um, Gradually, uh, we were working uh, in particular with, with one customer in, in Germany that was growing quite quickly. Um, and as they were growing, we then started adding, adding in other aspects of the stack. So as they built an, uh, their first office, um, we started using Cloud Radius to support the, um, the enterprise Wi-Fi in their office. And then as we expanded and delivered um, some new VPN services and some other um, uh, cloud-based services that that didn't support um, either SAML or OSCD, we then added in Cloud LDAP. Um, uh, they're running on a password manager. So these days um, we're using the, the whole stack. We're supporting that particular customer as well, using um, the policy management and patch management as well. So pretty much there's, there's not much in Jump Cloud that we're not using these days. That's that's great to hear. We're getting the the best value, which is uh, which is fantastic. And um, when you're sort of positioning Jump Cloud to your well, I guess firstly, I mean, do you position Jump Cloud to your clients, or are you positioning the the outcomes of the solution? We do. Um, I think it does need to be identified because I mean, I, I I I agree with you that in one sense we could just hide it within the you know, the overall package that that we offer. Um, but I think we found, I generally found that it's beneficial to, to present it as part of that solution. Um, so yeah, we, we do, we, we do name it and we, we talk about the benefits that it, it brings. And, and I think partly it's about being authentic rather than trying to brand it as our own. Um, you know, when we're working with partners, we're very clear about that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, it is important, as you say, because um, I, hopefully there's a bit of brand recognition or, or the, the user that can go and look at the Jump Cloud website and see that there's a sort of legitimate company behind it and it's a, it's a proper product as well. Indeed. I think, I mean, for us, obviously, we want to retain that relationship as customers grow, but we also recognise that um, there may come a time when they they may decide they've outgrown us. And so I think that's one of the other reasons why we it, we make it clear up front that these these partners that we're working with 
um, you know, they offer the, the product standalone. They, they can, you know, their cust we're not tying them into anything of working with us in the future, really. So I think that's that's key. Yeah. And, and from a price, you mentioned, obviously, you do isolate the product, but from a pricing point of view, do you include it, it in the bundle or do you, is it a separate line item for the we, we, services? We we're doing both, actually. So we've got we've got some bundle pricing and we've got um, with with one customer where they've they've grown um, uh, uh, beyond a certain size. We've we've agreed uh, you know, to split out the uh, the licensing and the support services um, separately. So we are doing both. OK. Uh, I think that's pretty common. I think a lot of MSPs are in the same boat and that so uh, I think um, that makes sense. So talking about MSPs, um, there'll be some listening and watching this that are probably are just starting with Jump Cloud or looking at Jump Cloud. If you were speaking to an MSP and they were saying, I've, you know, I've, we've been looking at this thing called Jump Cloud and you say, OK, I, I use that. Um, what sort of advice would you give them to help them be successful with Jump Cloud? So I think that one of the key things is that it's a very powerful platform um, and some of the elements of it are incredibly straightforward to deploy. Other elements, um, I guess, particularly the, the SSO element is going to take some time to get up to speed on. But you know, the payoff for that is the onboarding experience you can deliver your clients is really slick. You know, I mean, that's that's the key thing that um, has been always been the selling point you know, for us is that we can deliver a seamless remote onboarding experience, which is pretty hard to do. It's you know, it's not it's not something that a lot of people talk about it, but it's a lot harder to actually deliver than it is to um, to talk about it and market it. So that's the key thing. OK, well, we've not actually discussed yet your the type of devices that you support. So is it a mixture of Windows, Mac? Have you got Linux or is it all Windows? What does the sort of break breakdown look like? So it's probably majority Windows, but there's also a significant Mac and Linux um, uh, breakdown as well. So I think probably on the Linux front, it tends to be more in the cloud. So it's rather than Linux client devices, it's devices that we need to support in the cloud. So you know, we've got one customer in particular that's got a significant amount of resource inside a AWS that is uh, where access is managed through the Jump Cloud agent. So it, it gives us a very simple and quick way of giving the, the right the people in in different teams access to the resources they need. And then on the client front, it probably it's about a seventy five percent Windows, twenty five percent macOS, with a very small amount of of Linux clients too. Yeah, Linux client people that use Linux as a desktop client are a, a rare, a uh, different breed, I think, to uh, the majority yeah. of us mainstream users. They are, but it's one of the, the things that for me was a really big selling point of Jump Club because the point is they are incredibly niche, and generally speaking, the solution is is pretty poor. So, you you generally tend to find that, um, you know, where there is Linux support, it's it's a second rate support. It's, you know, it's it's support, but with a very limited subset of functionality. The fact that with Jump Cloud, we can manage both the access and the patch management um, and give a really um, a, a, a feeling of I've got true access into this system rather than I've got access, but it's really a compromise. I think that's the big that, that was for me a really significant plus point. Yeah, that's good. It talks, it reminds me a little. I mean, I've been in the the MSP game a long time, but it reminds me a little of of several years ago where MSPs would, if they if they did Mac, it was very little, and they kind of were treated almost as sort of second class citizens in terms of they probably could do a little bit of monitoring on there, but they probably couldn't do patch or anything or remote remote assistant wasn't very good. Because I think that with Jump Cloud, the core thing is that we hopefully sort of treat Mac, Windows and Linux as kind of equals and try and enable you to do the sort of same thing across all the platforms, which is nice. And it's nice that you're hearing you're using all three. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, I mean, it's it, it's really, I mean, ironically, it's with the Mac and the MDM integration with Jump Cloud where um, the, the that onboarding experience is taken to its absolute pinnacle. You know, I mean, that the out-of-box experience uh, you know, on a, on a MacBook for our customers 
on Jump Cloud is second to none. You know, I mean, it really is a, a great onboarding experience. You've got that that team, and you know they're remote. They're perhaps feeling a bit detached. Um, giving them that really slick um, first experience. You, you know, you can't, you 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 cannot, um, you know, replay that. You, you you know whatever you deliver that first time is what they're going to see and i think that's you know the, the feedback from our customers that where we've deployed mdm for apple on jump cloud has been phenomenal really really good yeah that's good to hear and i know we're getting kind of sort of big strides on trying to improve that experience on windows as well which is not as it's not as simple as i'm sure you're aware because the more to do yeah. different oems and things from microsoft makes life a lot harder but, um hopefully we can begin to get there. And I guess quickly on the devices front, you mentioned the sort of desktops. Do you do anything with mobile, with Android or iOS on that, that side? A little, little bit with iOS. Um, I mean, it's it's not a, a massive draw. Generally, what we're tending to find is with the, the type of companies that we're working with, with particularly startups and scale-ups, um, you know, it's a, you know, there's a challenge to persuade them why, you need a managed onboarding experience for a laptop. That's that can be a challenge in itself. Um, going the next step to telling them the same for their, you know, their their corporate phones. I mean, you know, very few of our customers are running on corporate phones just to start with. So, um, but but we have got a, a few um, in house. We're using it for iPad and uh, an iPhone. Um, and it and it's excellent, yeah. So we're we're kind of ready to to go, but we're just not finding a big demand for it with customers. No, and you mentioned co corporate owned phones there, which can maybe go off a bit of a talent tangent. Because the startups and scale ups, in in your sort of um, client base, are is it all corporate owned, or or are some of them sort of working on sort of bring your own device as well? It's what we're finding is it's on the phone. It's mostly bring your own. So there's a few. There's a handful of customers that are, are relying on um, on corporate phones, but but typically it's, it's bring your own company laptop, your own phone. That's the, the typical. It's the norm. Okay, it's good to know. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the industry. You mentioned, say, your, your kind of target, which is startup scale up businesses. Um, I'm guessing in those situations, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you're, you're kind of taking the role as the IT department. You're not working often with incumbent IT teams. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. And SMEs in general, I mean, you're saying that the data we're getting is more and more kind of small to medium businesses are going to MSPs to get assistance or to get help. I guess that's partly because maybe the landscape is becoming more complex and SMEs don't have their experience of doing that. But are you seeing sort of small businesses approaching MSPs like you to try and get help? I mean, I'm probably seeing, yeah, I mean, yes is the answer, but I'm seeing it in a particular way, which is often that people, people are able to onboard their initial say 365 deployment relatively easily um, and they get started and then it's the point where they start to grow that they realize a there's a bunch of configuration they never realized needed to be set up um, or they hit an issue a block and suddenly realize that the what looked quite simple and straightforward in that initial configuration wizard um, the moment you have to scratch slightly below the surface, suddenly they're stuck. So that's generally the pattern I see is that they they it's the initial basic configuration is quite often fine, but it's the point when they try to do something outside of that at base, suddenly they realize they need help. They reach out to somebody in their in their in their base, maybe it's their, you know, their web designer or someone someone else in their field and just say, do you know anyone that can help? So that's where a lot of the business is coming in that way. Yeah. And another thing is um, curious to know your your sort of feedback on this is from a sort of cyber threat point of view or a in and obviously we're both in the UK. So we we see headlines all the time about NHS being uh, attacked with cyber threats or uh, Greg's or whatever. This, these different things shutting down online services. I mean, is that message or is that uh, resonating with SMEs? Are they aware of the threats or are they kind of still thinking it's only going to happen to the um, to the big guys? They're not going to target us or is or is it are people kind of more aware of it now in general? 
I, I think it perhaps it, it tends to vary. I mean, because we're we're working with quite often with 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 digital startups who are building cloud infrastructure. I think there's a level of awareness that is perhaps not so representative generally of the SME market. My my, my own experience across some of the MSE, SMEs I've spoken with um, is that I think there's a there's a lot of a lot of extreme views. I'll be fine either because I'm small or surely we're OK because we're inside 365. We've set up. We haven't built and delivered things ourselves. So therefore we're in the in the cloud. It will be fine. Um, or they're the opposite extreme. They're, they're hyper vigilant and they're examining every. But on the whole, most, I think, um, have just got too much on their plate to stop and think about it. So I think, you know, that that's my, my view is that they probably the majority of SMEs just aren't thinking about it. Um, they very occasionally might stop and think and question, but uh, but they've just got too many other things to, to worry about. Yeah. And when you're raising this, that with them in terms of ex obviously part of your role is to is to explain that, which is why obviously you use Jump Cloud and um, you mentioned some of the reasons like the radius and the SSO and the deploying password manager. I mean, how do you? Um, sort of position that to a client without it sounding like you're just trying to sell another service or scaremongering or anything. I mean, I, I the the approach I take personally is not to lead on the cybersecurity front. So rather, I, I focus on the seamless onboarding, and then the um, the if you like the cherry on top that I'll present is and you get the the security as a consequence. Um, because I think, you know, generally it's that there's so much noise around cybersecurity that I think if you do lead on that, you're in danger of just being drowned out by the, the general noise and the level of, um, you know, I think, you know, a lot of people then just tune out when they hear cybersecurity. Whereas actually, if you say, if you focus on um, the productivity enhancements, you know, getting the, getting your team up to speed more quickly, taking away that headache of managing all these different cloud systems and how people get in, um, that's a far easier sell. I th that's, my, that's my experience. You know, people can understand that. And then if you say at the end of it, oh, and by the way, you've actually delivered an enhancement in your security front as well, well, then that's great. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I would agree with that. OK, well, we're almost at time. I've got one final question, which... Uh, I'm sure it could be super useful from you because you've just set up uh, relatively recently a new MSP during COVID. So I'm sure that wouldn't be the advice to try and do it during that time. But if you were chatting to someone that was just kind of starting out with an MSP, what sort of piece of advice would you give them? Or another way to to sort of phrase that question is, what would you have done differently if you were, if you were starting again today? What would you do differently? I think have a, a really clear idea around purpose. I think I spent a lot of time at the beginning focusing on the things that I didn't want to do or the areas I didn't want to work um, from my you know, background and experience. Um, and then it was relatively late in the day that I then actually started to focus on, um, on why it was I wanted to do this and who I wanted to work with. And it, it was there that I, I realized, for example, you know, working with disruptors was, a, was an important um, factor for me, but I think put a bit of time into um, purpose, um, and also um, you know, try to the, the the big thing that I you know always say to my team is eat your own own dog food. That's that's my kind of watchword. Solve the problems for yourself. Yeah, don't don't um, don't spend your time focusing on the problems that you're going to help your customers solve and actually leave them. Um, unsolved for yourself. So, you know, solve those problems in house, solve the problem of a remote team, solve the onboarding problem, do it well. And then when you're talking to customers, you can talk in, you know, in a very authentic way. Yeah, great tip. And obviously MSPs, generally speaking, are SMEs themselves. And so they're, they're kind of a similar size business to the companies they're supporting. So uh, that eat your own dog food is great advice. So thanks so much, Chris, for joining us. Um, it's fantastic insight. Thanks for being a, a great Junk Cloud partner. All the best for the future and uh, hopefully see you soon. Thanks, Chris. Nice to talk to you. Likewise. Take care.